Okay, good morning. My name is John Mukeda. We have been going through the study on uh, Calvinism and the doctrine of salvation. And uh, last Sunday we were looking at uh, the five points. We started a session on the five points of Calvinism. We covered the first two. That is a total depravity and the unconditional election. Today we are going to the fourth, no, the third and the, the, the fourth one. That is limited atonement and irresistible grace. And the, the five points of Calvinism are also referred to as the doctrines of grace. But before we start, I would like us to turn to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for enabling us to wake up this morning to this, your day. We thank you, Lord, for giving us life. We want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who offered himself to die on the cross, to be born, to come to humble himself and take human flesh, even though he is God, so that he could save his people from their sins. We pray, Lord God, that even as we think about these doctrines of grace, we will rejoice to know, Lord God, that Jesus Christ is truly a savior, a savior of even the vilest of sinners, we pray, Lord God, that we will know your presence and your blessings this day. Be with us and bless your word to us this morning, for we pray this in Jesus' name. So we are considering limited atonement, and uh, atonement refers to the forgiveness of our sins by the Lord Jesus Christ, his sinless life and his sacrificial death on the cross. That is what atonement is. So when we are talking about atonement, it can't be in any other, any other way. It is the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, offering himself to die on the cross, living a sinless life and suffering a death on the cross so that he could save sinners from their sin, so that he could become a substitute for them. So there are a few questions that I would like us to consider even as we, we look at this topic. The question, the first question is, was Christ's death only an example for us to follow in order to be saved? And then the other question is, did Christ's death just make it possible for all sins to be paid for and to make it possible for all men to be saved? If Christ died for all men, why are not all men saved? Is God not able to do what he desires to do? For whom did Christ die and whose sins did he actually pay for? Whom did Christ reconcile to God? Because that is what we read, particularly in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Did Christ die to save everyone? And that is a universal redemption for the whole world according to Arminianism or to save only those God elected. We are referring to saving his people because that is what we read in Matthew chapter 1. The name he was given, Jesus, 
Uh, in Matthew chapter 1, I think it will be rendered a lot this, this time because it's Christmas. You shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus, talking to his disciples, he describes them as his friends. He gave his life for his friends. Also, the church is described as his bride, and Christ purchased the church with his own blood. We read about that one in uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and also in Ephesians. When you look at those questions, the questions we were asking, what would be the answer for all of them? When we are asking, was Christ's death only an example for us to follow in order to be saved? What would be the, the simple answer to that question? Is the answer yes or no? No. Did Christ's death just make, make it possible for all sins to be paid for? and make it possible for all men to be saved? If Christ died for all men, why are not all men saved? Because it's true, not all men are saved. And yet when you read, uh, for example, Second Corinthians chapter 5, it, it, it says, He died for all, therefore all have died. We, we need to understand what, it, what all men refers to in the, the, the scriptures that refer to Christ's death being for all men, being a ransom for all men or for the world. We need to understand what is implied in that one. And then, as we have seen, particularly from, from Matthew and John and other parts passages of scripture, Christ actually came to die for, for his people. Calvinism teaches that Jesus' death on the cross made salvation definite for the elect. We are talking about uh, limit and atonement, but it is also definite, definite atonement. And, and, and the reason why some would be more comfortable with definite atonement is because there is nothing that limits the power of Christ to save sinners. He sacrifices infinite merit. And his sacrifice is completely sufficient to save sinners but it is made definite only for those whom God has chosen, his elect. So even if we are talking about irresistible grace, we can't help talking about election because election is the one that marks the sinners for salvation because we are talking about those who are chosen by the Father and given to the Son and to be redeemed by the Holy Spirit. And these are the ones Christ came to secure their redemption. Christ's sacrifice provides complete satisfaction for specific sinners. And so it is definite in design and also in its accomplishment. That is what we, are, we mean by limit and atonement, or particular redemption. This doctrine of limit and atonement summarizes what the Bible teaches about the purpose of the death of Christ on the cross. There are several other terms that are used. We have already talked about a particular redemption or definite atonement, 
definite redemption, actual atonement, or intentional atonement. I just remember uh, those people who played darts, where they, they throw arrows on a bond. You are not just throwing it aimlessly. You are, you, you are trying to aim at a particular number, and that is where you target. And so even the death of Christ was targeting a particular group, the elect of God. That is what we need to realize. And that is what makes it to be limited. That is what limits the atonement, because it is targeting a particular group, the elect of God. And that is why these points, five points of Calvinism are very much related to one another. The death of Christ on the cross was intentional, and it had a definite purpose. And that is why it had to accomplish that purpose. It's not limited in power. The atonement is limited in scope because it is focusing on the elect of God. Every sin of every one of Christ's sheep is paid for. I would like us to look at the the, constitu- the, 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 the the confession of faith. It is chapter six, no chapter nine. Chapter nine is on free will. We have referred to this one before. When we were looking at unconditional election, we refined to this section, so we don't even have to to spend a lot of time on it, but to acknowledge that those who framed the confession of faith were actually seeking to defend the truth, the purpose of Christ's death. So this, 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 uh, Section 6 comes under the free will, chapter 9 on the free will of the Baptist Confession of Faith. As God has appointed the elect to glory, so he has by the eternal and completely free purpose of his will foreordained all the means. Therefore, those who are elect, elected, that is being, being fallen in, in Adam, are redeemed by Christ, effectually called to faith in Christ by his spirit working in due season, justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith to salvation. None but the elect are redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved. So, when you look at this confession of faith, it's talking about those who are the elect appointed. God has appointed the elect to glory. So there is the the election, and then for 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 indeed all the means that would. Be, accomplish that purpose. And those who are elected are out of the human race, those who are fallen in Adam, they are the ones who are being redeemed by Christ, effectually called. And the spirits to faith in Christ by his spirit working in due season. So this section actually is not just talking about limited atonement, the fact that the atonement of Christ was limited to the elect, but it is also even touching 
on the other point, like irresistible grace, because we are talking about effectual call, as we shall see later on. It is also touching on the perseverance of the saints, because it is saying these ones are justified and obtained, sanctified and kept by his power through faith to salvation. So you can see even there the, the confession actually touches on the, the five points of Calvinism, even if we are just looking at one clause. The question that we might want to ask is, is limited atonement biblical? Is it biblical? Hmm? The answer is yes. The atoning work of Christ on the cross had a definite purpose in mind as revealed in both the Old and the New Testament. I would like us to look at uh, the Old Testament, for example, Isaiah chapter 53, a very well-known passage that is usually ready over Easter because it talks about the suffering of Christ. And uh, I want somebody to read that one. It's already there. Somebody can read it. Thank you. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. Continue. Verse 11. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion which, sorry, with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So you can see the, the suffering and the death of Christ was having a particular group in mind. Like verse 8 talks about the transgression of my people. And uh, my servant in verse 11, my servant make many to be accounted righteous and they shall bear the iniquities. It's talking about the substitutionary death of Christ. Even verse 12 is talking about him bearing the sin of many and making intercession for the transgressors. We have already referred to Matthew chapter 1. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. His people, specific people, that was the target of the death of Christ. And even when you look at the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals? For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people from God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. So even there, Christ was slain 
and by his blood, he has ransomed people, specific people from every tribe, from every language, from people and nation. Also, in, in John chapter 10, John chapter 10 is that great chapter on the shepherd where the Lord says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my, I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So he is saying he knows his own. In the same chapter, because he is, he, he is having an, a confrontation with the religious leaders, he actually tells them, you are not part of my sheep. It is the Lord who knows the heart anyway, so he can tell people, you are not his sheep. He, 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 could, he, he could know who one is and who was not. So he knows his own. I know my own. I lay down my life for the sheep. And chapter 6, a passage which we will be referring to quite often. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but lay, raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So there is a specific people, the sheep, as we saw in John chapter 10. And here, these are the ones given to Christ. These are the ones for whom he lent his life, a specific group. And Ephesians chapter 1 talks, chapter 1 verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. So there are people chosen by God before the foundation of the world. And those are the focus of the atonement of Christ. That is why the atonement is limited. Because it was having a specific group in mind. God's people. The atonement, as we look at it in terms of Christ's death, was substitutionary. He died in their place. He actually bore their sins on the cross. And therefore, he accomplished what God intended him to do, to justify many. So the atonement was intentional, it was definite, and it achieved its purpose. Christ's death secured full salvation. And there are several passages that tell us that Christ came to save sinners, and the way he was going to accomplish that was through his death, so that he could reconcile us to God, so that we could be justified. And there, there are several passages, we, will, we don't have time to look at it, but there are several passages it that tell us what Christ's death means. Reconciliation, justification, regeneration, and sanctification. So Christ's work on the cross was for the elect. These are the ones given to him by the Father. He is the good shepherd who lays down his sheep and none of those sheep will be lost, as we have already seen in John chapter 10. And when you look at the high priest's prayer in John chapter 17, Christ is praying for his disciples, but he also prays for others who would believe through the preaching of the gospel through the apostles. And these are the elect. 
So the elect are the recipients of the blessings of Christ. They are the ones who are blessed in Christ. Maybe we can look at Romans chapter 5. Somebody read for us Romans chapter 5. By story of and then seventeen to nineteen. Romans five twelve. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Seventeen. For if by the one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness we reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one's man, one man's righteousness, act the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Okay. So it's, it's a comparison of the redeeming work of Christ to the condemning work of Adam. Because in Adam all sinned, but in Christ all will be justified. Those who are in Christ will be justified because Christ has paid for their pardon. So when we consider the, the election, the Father's election is the one that limits the atonement of Christ because, again, it's looking at the ones that are given. The elect are the ones that are given to Christ. They are the ones for whom Christ died. I think that is what we need to realize. But also we need to realize that uh, there are passages like John chapter 3 which talks about God loving the world. But we need to interpret that one, the world to, be both, to mean both Jews and Gentiles. God loving the world of sinners, both Jews and Gentiles. The Father gave to Christ those for whom Christ died. So there is the elect and the ones given to Christ, and they are the ones, the subject of the death of Christ. See, if, if we are still in the Romans, we can read verse 5 of chapter 5. No, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, God's love and Christ's death come together. It's focusing on the same group. God's love for us, Christ's death for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the limit and atonement of Christ is based on the Father's unconditional election. And the passage that would uh, give that one quite clearly is uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 39. The whole of that passage, we can even just look at verse 32 of Romans chapter 8. He who did not spare his own son but gave him have for us, how will he also with him not graciously give us all things? Sometimes we may interpret that passage to refer to material blessings. But we need to realize, to, to look at that passage from its wider context. Because it is talking about 
the fact that there is nothing that is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is the emphasis of the passage from verse 31 to the end of the chapter of Romans chapter 8. The other area that we need to consider is uh, the, the work of the Spirit. Spirit's indwelling. The death of Christ is connected to the death of all who are in him. The spiritual death of believers is possible through the Holy Spirit. We can look at, if since we... Uh, we're in Romans, but Romans chapter 6, that is what the emphasis is, the fact that we need to consider ourselves as having died in the death of Christ so that we may be raised with him and therefore living lives that are honoring to God by putting to death the deeds of the flesh, crucifying sin and and, 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 and killing sin in our lives, which is possible because we are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. Let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen and fifteen. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised again. It's talking, it's talking about the spiritual death of believers. All have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised again. So we consider ourselves dead to sin, dead to the things of the world, so that we can live for Christ and for his glory. Maybe the question that we, the other question that we need to ask is, why do people object the doctrine of limits and atonement? What we need to realize is uh, there is a, mis a, a, a mystery Because what you are saying is those who, who will be saved are only the elect. But then we also realize that when the gospel is preached, it is preached to everyone. God freely and sincerely offers salvation to everyone. There are passages that we cannot deny. Like Ezekiel or even Matthew. That's why we are saying it's a mystery. We can't understand why the gospel is, is orphaned, why, why God says he doesn't, he doesn't take pleasure. Ezekiel 33 verse 11, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked might, that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And Matthew 11, verse 20, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And even Second Peter, Second Peter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. And 
the, almost the last verse of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 17, a spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. That is the offer of the gospel. Those truths, the fact that God saves the elect, and yet God doesn't desire the death of any sinner, those truths are revealed in the word of God. And that's why we are saying it's a mystery. We cannot understand God's ways because his ways are higher than ours. The duty we have is to preach the gospel faithfully, knowing that God has his elect. It's like when, <coughs> when, when Paul was in Corinth, a very wicked city, and yet God appeared to him and, they told, and they encouraged him and told him that he has many people in the city of Corinth. And as a result, Paul preached the gospel, labored there for more than a year, a year and a half, I think. And a church was born out of a city which was very wicked. There are several passages that are universal when it comes to the offer of the gospel. And those are the ones that sometimes people take to, that makes some people have problems with uh, accepting this doctrine of limited atonement. Like John 1, verse 9, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. And verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So there is the one there in John chapter 3, in John chapter 3, in John chapter 4, and as we have already seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, there is that emphasis on all. It's as if those passages are telling us that every, everyone can be saved, but we need to realize that uh, even though the, the, the gospel is offered to everybody, still everybody without distinction, that is what we need to realize. It's not, it, it's not the world, when we, 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 we we look at the world, it's the world of sinners, both Jews and Gentiles. And then it's all without exception. The, the gospel is often to all without exception. But there is a distinction when it comes to the redeeming work of Christ. First Timothy but chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. It even as John itself, chapter 2, verse 2, Christ being the propitiation for the whole world. And so, the argument is, if he died for all, then he did not die for a limited number. That is how people argue against this doctrine. But we need to also consider other passages in, this, in the Word of God that specifically talk about the death of Christ being specific for a particular group. And we have already considered many of those. I don't think we need to look at that. <coughs> I would like us to move to number three. My time seems to be running very fast and we have not looked at the other one. Is this doctrine a hindrance to evangelism? 
I don't think it is a hindrance to evangelism, really. If anything, it is an encouragement to know that Christ actually died for, to redeem a specific people, should give them, minister of the gospel, a lot of encouragement. What, what, the, what the preachers should be telling people is Christ died for sin, for sinners like you and me. Yet, we need also to remember that the offer of the gospel is genuine. When the gospel is preached, every, anybody can believe and be saved. And so Calvinism has a lot of encouragement to ev evangelism. Let's move on and look at uh, this other point number four, irresistible grace. I'm still starting with some questions. Why do two people, precisely in the same circumstances, react in the opposite way? Why does one person believe the gospel and another does not? Why does one person believe and another reject Christ? The gospel is preached. Some believe, some will not, even in the same family. You may have some believing the Lord and others not believing. And we are saying the answer to these questions is irresistible grace. Grace is God's undeserved and unmerited favor. Grace is making spiritual bastards into his own children and heirs of and such our riches. Grace is God's free and unmerited power to save a person from his sins and from eternal hell and bring him to heaven. That is what grace is. God giving us what we don't deserve. Because from the very first point, we, we are talking about total, total depravity, total inability, then in sin. We can't raise ourselves. And that's why we need the grace of God if we are going to be saved. Irresistible grace teaches that God's grace to save a person cannot be resisted. It is effectual grace because God's intentions will have the intended effect on a person's life. So again, there, there are several words used to describe this irresistible grace, it is effectual calling or efficacious call of the Spirit or being transformed by the Holy Spirit. Again, it is a, a summary, irresistible grace is a summary of what the Bible teaches about the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in the salvation of sinners. And what we are saying is the Spirit works on the elect to bring them to faith in Christ. But we need to realize that God's calling can be resistant for a period of time. But this resistance will eventually be overcome. The Holy Spirit will work to achieve the purpose of bringing a sinner to Christ. 
we have, I said earlier on, we, were, we, 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 we have John chapter 6, we have referred to it so many times, but verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And they resist. Jesus is the, is the one who is saying, all that the Father has given me will come to him. And he says, and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. In verse 44, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So there is the drawing of the Father. And if a sinner is drawn to Christ by the Father, who can resist? Can, can, can the sinner resist? Yet we need to realize that when it comes to salvation, there isn't anybody who is saved unless they are drawn by God. No one can be saved unless they have been drawn by God. So if today you are a believer, it is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, transforming you, changing you, giving you new birth, making you a child of God. Titus 3 verse 5 says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So there is regeneration, new path. And there is the, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why it's necessary for the, the, the Spirit to work in our lives is because we know we are dead. The natural man is dead in his sins and trespasses. But the, the same Ephesians that tell us, Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 1, it says, you were dead, but God has made you alive. Man is spiritually dead, and therefore he must be made alive in order to respond to the gospel. And that is what Ephesians emphasizes. <coughs> Being born again is a sovereign act of God. And that is what makes us Believe the gospel. What we need to realize is uh, there isn't anybody who is forced to go to heaven against their will. No, nobody is, is dragged, kicking and screaming to heaven. God transforms us and makes us willing. That is, that is what we read in Psalm 110 verse 3. Your people offer themselves freely on the day of your power. So God is at work in the elect to transform them. To give them a new heart and to make them willing to follow Christ, to come to Christ. Paul himself in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10 says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what Paul says. He attributes the change in his life to the grace of God. But you remember, and we shall look at this example later on, Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9 verse 6, when after that encounter, the light that is, the bright light that is shown the question that he asks is, Lord, what would you have me to do? 
what is it that you want me to do? When he realized he is before the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's example is always interesting because uh, he wasn't going on a, a mission to preach the gospel to the people in, uh, in Damascus, although he ended up doing exactly that. But he was going to persecute the Christians. Yet when he met the Lord Jesus, his life was completely transformed. And that's why he attributes everything to the grace of God. God sending his spirit to work in the life of a sinner, the elect, and we are saying that work itself must accomplish its purpose. Through irresistible grace, God regenerates man, changes his nature, and radically alters his character so that man now is truly sorry for his sin and loves God. And what we are saying when we are talking about irresistible grace, we are saying that the Holy Spirit never fails to accomplish the goal of saving the sinner and bringing that person to Christ. That person will hear because he is given a new life. He is regenerated. There are several passages that talk about uh, the offer of salvation. Because we need to realize, like we said earlier on, the, the gospel is preached to all. So Isaiah 45 verse 22 says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. That's the offer of the gospel. In fact, Isaiah 45 verse 22 is the verse that was preached when, the, the, when, when Spanjon was it is the, the verse that God used for the conversion of Spanjon. And Isaiah 55, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat, come, buy wine and milk, without money, without a price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. In verse 6 and 7, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. They are gone, for he will abundantly pardon. So that is the promise of salvation. For those who call upon the Lord, those who seek the Lord. <coughs> but the question is, does this bring sinners to Christ? Does it bring sinners to Christ, that free offer of the gospel? It doesn't. And the reason is because Man is dead in sin. That is what total de depravity is. The gospel is offered to all without distinction, but we need to realize that no amount of external threatening or promises will cause a blind, deaf, rebellious sinner to bow to Christ and look to him for salvation. That is why the Spirit must work in one, we call it the special in one call of the Spirit to the elect. God is at work as the gospel is being preached to change people's lives and bring them to Christ. And that is regeneration. When the sinner is given a new heart, his nature is changed. And one is made a child of God. His will is renewed so that one can respond to Christ, to, to come to Christ freely. 
without being forced. So the core is efficacious, it is invincible, it cannot be conquered, it is irresistible. It must result in faith in Christ Jesus. Again, I would like us to look at uh, the, the confession of faith. This time is chapter 10 on God's degrees. It's section 1 and 2. Section 10, 1 says, Those whom God has predestined to life, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time to effectually call by his will, by his word and spirit. He calls them out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. He enlightens their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God. He takes away their heart of stone and gives to them a heart of flesh. He renews their wills and by his almighty power causes them to do what is good. He effectually draws them to Jesus Christ, yet in such a way that they come completely freely, for they are made willing by his grace. So that is uh, what this section says. It's talking about those who are predestined to life. The elect. It's talking about the effectual call, effectually called. The call of the Spirit will achieve its purpose. And, and that call is through the word of God, the preaching of the gospel. That is why it's important to preach the gospel and also to depend upon the Holy Spirit. And here, the heart, the, the, there is a change. The heart of stone is removed. The will is renewed. And they are drawn to Jesus Christ. And when they are coming to Christ, they are coming freely without, any, without being forced. That is the power of the grace of God, the irresistible grace of God. Section 2, this effectual call of God's free and special grace alone, not on account of anything at all foreseen in us. Now this effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not on account of any, anything at all foreseen in us. It's not meant because of any power or action in us. For if we are all together, or we are all together passive in it, we are then in sins and trespasses until we are made alive and renewed by the Holy Spirit. By this regeneration, we are enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it. This power being none other than that which raised up Christ from the dead. I think that is what we read in Ephesians. The power that raised Christ from the dead. In Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 19 to 20. And that is the same power that raises us from our spiritual death. We are given new life. We are given a new heart. The will is changed. We come willingly. We are not forced. We are meant willing in the day of God's power. We realize that the five points are very much related to each other. They depend on each other. Limit and atonement means that God from all eternity foreordained certain people and that he sent his son to die for them as a substitute for them, to save them. 
So those are the people that Christ came to die for. And then when we look at the unconditional election, the certainty of election means that the Spirit works certainly to accomplish what God foreordained. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to that is the golden chain. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those he, whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. It's the same people, the same, the same number, whom God foreknew, whom he predestined. And in time, through the preaching of the gospel, he called them, he justified them, he glorified them. Glory, of course, is in future when Christ returns. But still, it is as if it is accomplished. The Lord will bring us to glory. He who has begun a good work in us is able to complete it. So when you look at total depravity, man's total depravity means that man is unable to do good and also unable to resist the God's purpose in election. The negative sign of total depravity is that the fact that man is not able to do any, anything good, but also man cannot resist God's purpose in election. What the, the, the person who is dead in sin means is resurrection, being given a new life. And the example we like using is the case of Lazarus. Could Lazarus remain dead when Christ gave him life? Because when, the, when, when, when Jesus sent, asked them to open the grave, one of the sisters saying that there, there must be some smell now because he has been dead for four days. He was true, Lazarus was truly dead. And here is Jesus calling him, Lazarus, come forth. And what happens? Lazarus comes forth because there is power in the word of Christ. Christ gave him life and he could not resist coming, rising from the dead when Christ has uh, 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 and given him life. The dead in sin must be made alive in Christ. It is impossible for the dead ones to resist being made alive. Then there is the case of the illustration of the new birth in John chapter 3. The conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus when he tells him you must be born again. And when you look at the natural birth, when time comes, one must be born. The one who is being born can't resist it. That is what we are saying. And uh, neither can anyone resist the new birth. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 talks about the one in Christ being a new creation. And the thing that is being created cannot refuse to be created. God is powerful. God is omnipotent. And no one can resist God's purpose in the spiritual creation. Ephesians 2 verse 10 talks about believers being God's workmanship. Again, those, the person who is making something, that thing itself cannot resist it to be made. It must be made. And so what we are seeing is the power of God, the greatness of God's power in, 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 in uh, the salvation of sinners. Without irresistible grace, no one could be saved, since the natural man is unable to accept the things of God.
I think we, our time is gone. I will take a very few minutes. There, there are several examples. We have already referred to Paul's example. So we don't need to look at that one. There is the example of Lydia in Acts chapter 16. Where, verse 14, we are told, God opened her heart. Without the Lord opening her heart, she could not believe. And if you are a Christian today, you can also think about yourself. How did the Lord save you? Bearing in mind that you, you were dead in sin. But by grace, you are what you are today. If there is one who is not saved, the message to you is the message that was given to the Philippian jailer when he asked, what must I do? Paul told him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what the sinner needs to hear. You don't have to reason. Unless the Spirit moves me, I can't do anything. <coughs> it's your responsibility to believe because that is the command of the Lord, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then later on, you can thank him because he's the one who is working in your life to make you willing. So, as we have already seen, even though there are misconceptions about this, this doctrine, still, it is what the Bible teaches. People are not forced to accept Christ. They are not dragged. God makes his people willing. Does this doctrine teach that the Holy Spirit cannot be resistant? What we need to realize is God's grace can be resistant for some time, even by the, the, the elect. But eventually, God is able to, the, the Spirit of God is able to overcome that resistance. Because God has the power. He does what he wills. Daniel chapter 4 verse 35 says, He does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can stay his hand. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he wills. So God is able to accomplish his purpose, the purpose of bringing his elect to salvation, even though they may resist. So if anybody is, is going to come to faith, one must be born again, one must be regenerated, and that is the work of the Spirit. But once that happens, the gospel itself becomes sweet, the resistance is gone, and there is joy because of what the Lord has done. I would like to end this session by a quotation from John Newton. What do you know about John Newton? Eh? Amazing grace. And we are talking about irresistible grace. And uh, if you, 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 you ever read the life of John Newton, you, it really shows, it demonstrates how God was gracious in saving him, somebody who was a rebel. He says, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I hope to be in another world but still I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. He who has been pleased in love and kindness to draw us to himself and to be, to be found by us when we sought him not. No, he has been pleased in love and kindness to draw us to himself and to be found by us when we sought him not. And what, what the picture that comes to, to mind there is Paul himself. Christ met him when he was going to persecute the church. I think we will stop there. We're going to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise your name for the great plan of salvation for a people. We want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have this morning of hearing your word preached. Lord, we know the world is uh, celebrating Christmas, the birth of Christ. But the majority of people will not even stop to ask, why did Christ come? Yet, Lord, he came in a humble way. He truly humbled himself and took a flesh, human flesh, so that he could die for, for people like us. We pray, Lord God, that we will rejoice in such a great salvation. We know it is by grace that we are saved. So be with us, Lord, and help us to rejoice because of the work that you have done in our lives. Help us to rejoice because the Savior came into this world, the Lord Jesus Christ, and help us, Lord, to honor him even throughout this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.